everyone, and welcome to our panel. My name is Colleen Carroll, and I'm a content publishing coordinator at Nexus Marketing and your moderator for today's panel session. Our topic today is the whole picture, the power of storytelling for nonprofits. And I'm super excited to jump into this conversation. But as usual, before we get there, I do have a few quick logistics to cover. NX Unite is made in partnership with Nexus Marketing, and the NX Unite mission is to make introductions that lead to lasting relationships and serve as a hub for connection in the mission-driven sector. As you saw in our video, on NX Unite, you can find upcoming industry events, suggested influencers to follow, trusted solutions, cause-driven podcasts, and of course, panels with experts such as these lovely folks here with me today. Today's hour-long panel will include time both for questions curated by my team and questions from you all, our fantastic audience. We've already had some really wonderful questions submitted via registration, but I'd also love to hear from our live audience. So at any time during the panel, please feel free to start submitting your questions for our panelists in either the questions tab or directly in the chat, and then we'll spend the second half of the session dedicated entirely to answering as many audience questions as we can. So get them in early. The more we have early on, the more we're be able to get through. So let us know what's going to be helpful for you and your team. If at any point you're having any technical difficulties or have any logistics questions, my team member Malou is under the team NX Unite username and will do her best to assist. So give a little holler in the chat, let us know what's happening, and we'll figure out how to get you back on and enjoying the session as quickly as possible. I did also want to share that this panel session is being recorded. I saw there was a question in the chat about this. The session is being recorded and it will be accessible to you after the session. It's going to be automatically in your email inbox after we wrap up. So give it five or so minutes after we finish and that recording will be there for you all. It will also continue to be accessible on the NX Unite website in the on-demand panel section. So if you have any friends in the industry who you're like, can't believe they missed it, they needed to be there, that session was perfect for them, please feel free to share that same registration page that you use to sign up and they'll be able to access the recording. Finally, before I introduce today's panelists, I do want to thank you all for attending, whether you are joining us live or you are watching the recording. Thanks for taking time out of your day to learn with us, to join this NX Unite community. And if you are here, thank you for sharing where you're calling in from the chat. It's super fun to see that we're calling in from all over the world. So nice to have you all here with us today. All right, to begin with our introductions, I'd first like to introduce Claire Axelrad, who is the principal at Clarification. With over 30 years of fundraising experience, Claire is passionate about helping nonprofits create a culture of philanthropy that moves beyond transactions and into transformation. Claire's practical approach and expertise have earned her numerous awards and recognition, including AFP's Outstanding Fundraising Professional of the Year Award. Claire is based in San Francisco and enjoys craft fairs, baseball games, art openings, music, and political conversations. So glad you could be here with us today, Claire. Thank you. Also joining us today is Dave Norris, who is the CEO of Proof Pact, a software company revolutionizing community engagement for nonprofits. He is dedicated to making a positive impact through technology with a deep understanding of both marketing and development. He brings a unique blend of creativity and technical expertise to the table. Dave has a proven track record as a former agency owner and is constantly exploring the latest and cutting edge technologies to drive his mission forward. Dave is a firm believer in the power of community storytelling and strives to deliver our unparalleled user experiences for nonprofits. Glad to have you here today, Dave. Thanks, Colleen. Here with us also is Kristen Steele, who is the creative director of Swaim Strategies. As a writer and teacher by trade, she partners with nonprofits to increase their impact and fundraising by strategically improving how they tell their stories at events. Kristen helped start the consulting firm Swaim Strategies in 2004 and co-authored the book, Planning a Successful Major Donor Event. As a passionate nonprofit advocate, she speaks nationally to help organizations generate change in their communities through their events. Glad to have you, Kristen. Thanks for having me, glad to be here. And finally here with us today is Patrick Rafferty, who is the owner, producer, and director of Rafferty Weiss Media. He has over 20 years experience as a producer and a director of TV spots, corporate image films, and marketing videos. He has directed what you might call an intriguing mix of public figures and celebrities, including Bill Gates, John Glenn, C. Everett Koop, Val Kilmer, Joe Gibbs, Wyclef Jean, Ryan Lochte, Quincy Jones, Ross Perot, and many major political figures. A leader in local nonprofit and philanthropic causes, he has been a featured speaker in undergraduate and graduate media production courses. Glad to have you here with us today, Patrick. Thank you. 
Happy to be All here. right, it is time for us to jump in and get started. And Claire, I'm gonna actually have you start us off with our first question. Have expectations and best practices related to storytelling for nonprofits changed over the past few years? Okay, well, I have seen a big change over the past several years um, because today there's a worry about the donor as hero story which has been effective for years in raising money, but some people are concerned that it smacks of white saviorism. And it can apply in any situation where donors are perceived to be in a position of power and privilege. And so the idea is that the donor unfairly gets to feel good about helping those less fortunate because they're part of the system that contributes to it. Uh, and that that keeps the people that are in need in their disadvantaged state. So the challenge is donors hero stories raise a lot of money. And when we don't use those stories, we raise less money. And tests have shown this to be the truth. So it means that less money is going to the people who are living in poverty or oppression. Um, but if you use those messages, you might be propping up this patriarchal white colonialist system. So right now there's a lot of people exploring how can we address this challenge? And I just saw a great piece on the Mosianic blog that had a before and after letter about child sex trafficking. And the first portrayed the child as a victim and the second as someone fighting to survive. And the donor could rescue her, which is the traditional way of fundraising or empower her to fight. And the appeal used words that would sort of pump up the donor's moral identity, like kind, compassionate, caring people like you, words that donors had used to describe themselves. And these all contribute to the donor's well-being, much as being a hero does. So there would be a difference we see between saying, your compassion helps her fight versus your gift will save a life. And it forges more of a direct connection between the donor and the child, not as a savior, but as sharing common values. Great, Claire, really appreciate you starting us off and people have already resonated with it. They have asked for the article. I don't know if you have it on hand, but if not, we'll find it after and get it to people. So thank you so much for starting us off, Claire. Dave, I'm gonna bring this same question over to you. How have you seen expectations and best practices change over the past years, particularly when it comes to storytelling? Yeah, and so I would have to preface this by saying that I take this uh, approach purely from an online standpoint. Um, and really thinking through what that means to community building um, through storytelling. And I think that um, to answer the question, I, I do think that even I've seen it change um, in the past few years um, in that what I think is happening is people are, are looking more towards uh, more at storytelling as, as though it is meant for community building in and of itself. Um, I also would say that I think that that's happening because they're realizing that younger generations that are interacting more online want to become a part of something and through storytelling, they can actually be inclusive of those voices. And so storytelling, the way that I've been um, maybe phrasing it is that it's uh, being inclusive of your community's voice and um, allowing them to share their story with you. And so it's not a nonprofit creating this monologue. It's a nonprofit enabling, or to use a word that Claire used, uh, empowering a dialogue. Thank you so much, Dave. All right, Patrick, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic as well. Any thoughts on best practices and how they've changed? Sure. Um, I'm going to fall uh, right behind Dave in empowering the people that are receiving the services. I see a big shift in that um, instead of making the donor, like Claire said, the hero, but it's the people that are benefiting um, from the nonprofits. And so when I go in to make films or to tell stories, I always want to talk to the people that are receiving. And it's not just the donor. It's not just the people on the other end. It's the families. It's the communities. It just it just mushrooms. There's a school, the Washington Jesuit Academy here in D.C. I'm on the East Coast and uh, 
you know, they're changing young, young men's lives, but it's not just the men, it's the people in the house with them when they go home, it's the community around them. And so those are always the storytelling angles I look for and not just, and the donor, they're smart, you know, they want return on investment. They want to know the numbers, you know, if they're going to give their time resources, they want to know what they're getting and that's never going to change. But I always want to tell the story through the people that are receiving. I think that's really helpful input. Thank you so much, Patrick. All right, Kristen, any concluding thoughts on this topic of how expectations have changed over the past few years? Well, it's hard to follow because I, I echo everything everybody's saying. I think, um, you know, storytelling as a um, culture shift within mission-driven organizations is something that we've seen continue to gain momentum. It used to be, you know, 15, 20 years ago in this work, you'd go in and talk to organizations about that, and there'd be a lot of groaning. There would be a lot of jockeying between program staff to figure out, like, my story's better. We need to tell, give equal time. So storytelling became a commodity and became a transaction when really the whole point of storytelling is to convey experience and understanding between human beings, right? Like, that's how we're hard hardwired. It's how we go through the, the world and understand what's happening around us. And so um, as that's continued to percolate, I think everybody's right on the money with the idea of ethical storytelling becoming the necessity. And what does that look like? And what is our responsibility to the folks that we are providing resource to? And I think what's different here is that organizations have started to lead with that. And for me, what that means is centering the storyteller um, and in their own narrative so that they are con continuing to, to benefit from empowerment and make choices and have agency in their life. But I also think donors are starting to become really savvy between understanding the difference between a story told ethically and a story that's told to manipulate. Um, and so I think as generations continue to shift, technology shift, and as our donors become savvy in consuming stories and sort of smelling the stink of something that is supporting all of these um, sort of oppressive systems, I think we also need to really just continue to center who's telling the story. I think we get a lot of questions about, you know, how do we disengage from sort of the trauma porn of storytelling and what that can be and how do we man not manipulate people? And, and the easiest path to that is to center the storyteller to decide their narrative and what they want to share and what that looks like. And also talking to them, not in the midst of their trauma. I think I think those pieces, if we use those as guideposts, we've started to really see those as best practices. And that's really transformed um, storytelling to be transformational for the storyteller telling it. Thank you so much, Kristen. All right, we are off to a wonderful start with this panel. Really appreciate you all with that first question. Um, Patrick, I'm gonna have you start us off with our next one. What role do you see storytelling taking in nonprofit strategy? So, my whole uh, industry has been turned upside down like everybody else's uh, <laughs> over the last five five years with, with COVID. But what we always are asked now, um, stories aren't linear anymore. Um, and so you do make a linear piece. We still deliver a linear piece, but within those pieces, there are lots of digital assets for Dave <laughs> to push out online. So we're always making so shorter social bits out of that linear story. And so it's not just one story anymore. It's many, many stories. And there's lots of assets. There's print, you know, there's digital, there's print, there's video, there's radio, there's podcasts. So there's all these things now that people can use to push out. So it's kind of fun being in, in this industry because we're all mashing together. <laughs> Everyone's mashing, you know, um, there's just not one film being made anymore. And so that, that is the beauty of, of this medium and, and technology being able to push out so much. Great, thank you so much, Patrick. Dave, over to you, thoughts on the role storytelling plays in larger strategy. Yeah, I think the strategic approach, and, and I wanna to touch on something that Kristen mentioned about donors being able to, able to sniff out, um, you know, maybe more of a manipulative uh, presentation you know, donors sharing their stories, let's say post donation, um, is a great way to create this sort of relatability and, and communal aspect to, um, I think what Patrick's talking about in terms of like many voices, right? And I think those many voices uh, are much more powerful 
than say something um, that is led by the nonprofit. Again, to say to say it again, it's you know one is a monologue, the other is a dialogue, and I I really do think that you know, now more than ever, brands are working through individuals or creators, you know, you turn on YouTube, like, there's so much product placement and affiliate marketing going on. And brands aren't just from the top down telling you how good their products are anymore. It's people, people are telling you why they enjoy this product. And you're like, well, I'm, you know, I'm subscribed to this person, I've been watching them for the past year, I must want that product too. And so, you know, now all of a sudden you're drinking Pepsi. I, 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 you know, the idea is that I think people relate to people more than, um, you know, an entity or, or brand, let's say story. Those are still important. You still need those mission statements and overall, um, you know, just in terms of that copy, but you, you do need the relatable aspect to community storytelling as well, I think. Definitely. Thank you so much, Dave. Kristen, over to you. How does strategy get impacted by storytelling? Yeah, um, I, Patrick, Dave, exactly. Um, I think uh, for me, you know, I sit in the event space and I sit specifically in the fundraising event space. Um, and so your, as you know, nonprofit organizations, your direct mail and your special appeal at your event are your, some of your biggest um, foundational fundraising moments and solicitations. Those should be anchored in story. Um, and Dave, I love what you're talking about, sort of that experience of something. Um, Simon Sinek, The Golden Power, Golden Circle of Why, um, The Power of Why is the book. He's got a great TED talk. But it talks about when you're talked to and you come from the outside in with the, the, the what, the how, and then you finally get to the why, you're coming opposite the direction our brains actually work. So when you create an emotional connection with people anchored in the why, which for mission driven organizations is should be at the core of everything you do and talk about with regard to your work, you put people in both the emotional center of their brain, but also the, the, the decision-making center of the brain. And the decision-making center of the brain is not attached to language, which is a funny thing. So when people say, I don't know, I donated all that money because it just, I felt like I needed to, it felt good. That means your story has done exactly what you wanted it to do. You got people to make the leap before they could go check their bank account, talk to you know other people, start getting data infused in that, all of those pieces. And so I think that experience, now that we're sort of um, moving back to in-person gathering and thinking about how people experience your mission in action is also part of your story. The story is not always just the story of one individual and where they are now as a result of coming into contact with your organization. It's the story is for your donors as well. How do they experience your work? How do you take them into the heartbeat of what you do and why you do it? And so I think you can create experiences of your work that are not always just beginning, middle and end like a story is as well. Thank you, Kristen. All right, Claire, over to you. Thoughts on the role of storytelling and strategy. I so much agree with everything that's been said. I want to take it in a little different direction because I work a lot with major gift fundraising. And one of the best tools is having your board involved in helping you with fundraising. And one of the ways, I mean, everybody loves to talk about themselves. What they don't like to do is fundraise. It's kind of like the F word. And so if if I can talk to board members and show them that fundraising is really about telling and hearing stories, not asking for money, they become a lot more comfortable. And so what I like to do is at a board meeting, just pair people up and ask them to talk to each other about why are you involved here? And they start to tell their personal story. And if you can do it two or three times in the course of the evening and you know, mix people up, they get to tell their story multiple times and hear multiple stories, which are inspiring. And then when you tell them, all you have to do is tell that story. When you go to fundraise, they become a lot more comfortable. And, you know, donors aren't interested in hearing the organization's story. I can't tell you how many times I go to work with somebody and they say, we need help raising money. And they never say why. They say, well, we're a maritime museum, we need help make raising money. They don't tell me the Simone Sinek story of why. 
like the ocean is sick. Let me tell you about what's happening. It's going to die. And that's what draws people in. Thank you so much, Claire. Kristen, I'm gonna have you start us off with our next question, but very quickly, I do wanna remind our audience that you can start submitting questions at any time. So send them in, we'll get to them in our second half of the session. But first, Kristen, to you, how do you define successful storytelling? What are the key elements that make a story compelling? Great question. I think for me, it's thinking about sort of the story itself, but also the atmosphere in which the story's happening. So consent is critical for, for us when engaging storytellers. Um, it's about having a conversation with them about how they feel about telling their story, talking through with them how you would like to utilize their story and what that looks like, and making sure they're a part of that process all along. I think um, sometimes once we get that initial sort of like, yeah, I could tell my story and we capture it, and then it resonates with donors. And then we just start using it on every channel all the time. And it takes on a different shape than what we initially sort of had a conversation about. I just encourage folks to go back and have that conversation. Like your story is connecting to people in this amazing way. Bring them into the why of what you're doing and how you're shifting. So consent is really big. Um, I think picking a storyteller, um, like I said earlier, that has their trauma in the rear view mirror has sort of a, a a sense of being not completely on the other side of something, but has some some look back perspective. It's that perspective that sort of completes that story arc um, and keeps us from re-traumatizing people. I think thinking about um, you know authentic voices centering the storytellers' voices versus us putting our boxes on them about what we'd like to check off about their story. If you're open and available to listening to the story, sometimes it goes into places that you don't have in the treatment on paper, and sometimes that's the best stuff. So I think it's it's being present, right, and being a part of what that looks like. And then I think it's about thinking about what the complete arc is. Not only do we want stories to talk about the now for them, how they're changed now, but I'm also, as a donor, what 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 are you looking forward to? What's the future forward, right? So I think it's it's getting to now with the story, but then it's also like, what does that mean? Also for your organization, we're doing this work now. And what that means for us moving forward is this. I think sometimes that feels um, sort of too ambitious or uh, too like, oh, I don't know if we're going to be here in five years. Don't tell me that as a donor. I want to know you're going to be here in five, 10, 50 years changing the world. I'm funding something that I want to be a part of now but also that's successful. And that means you have longevity and you have a plan for the future. So I think it's thinking about how to present that full arc of the story, both in the stories you're telling, but also in your story of as, as an organization. Thank you so much, Kristen, for starting us off. Before we hear from the rest of our panelists, I do wanna let our audience know that we have had a poll go live where we've asked you all, what do you think is the most important element of a successful story? So feel free to fill that out if you wanna let us know your thoughts or drop your thoughts in the chat. One of the options is other, let us know in the chat. So we would love to hear your thoughts on this topic as well. In the meantime, Claire, I'd love to hear from you. What would you define as successful storytelling? I guess I would say two words that begin with the letter E. They're emotional and they're experiential. And you think about if you go to a play or something and when you come out, like, did it connect with you? That's what's a successful story. Successful stories connect with their audience. And if you can talk with a donor about the person that they want to become, they'll keep listening or reading and it a successful story also to go back to our previous discussion is all also ethical and what what matters is the overlap between what compels a donor to give and how your clients and your program staff who are contributing want the story told and it's impossible to answer that for them if you've never experienced what they're going through, then you have to commit to a process of securing feedback to ensure that the story you tell is true and that you really honor that story. So you need to treat them as collaborators, as co-authors in the storytelling process. And then you need to ask yourself, how do I know what I wrote is true? 
And that holds you to a higher standard and it alerts you to a need to seek out more information to strengthen your story. And so you have to also ask yourself, what's influencing my perspective? And that kind of enhances your self-awareness, allows you to decenter yourself from the story and become the filter through which the story gets told. Thank you so much, Claire. Patrick, over to you. Thoughts on a successful storytelling strategy? Sure. Um, Claire and Kristen, so many of the things you said, I was going through my mind, going through all my different interviews with people and the trauma. It's so true, Kristen, you know, doing work with the Red Cross. I had to go back and drink, bring up Hurricane Katrina to survivors, you know, and this was yours. And I had, you know, grown adults in tears, but we were always very sensitive to it. And I would always go into these interviews with them saying, look, I'm going to ask you questions. We're going to go back. Um, but I said, if I ask, if, if there's anything you don't want me to ask you, please let me know. So you always have to respect the storyteller. Like you said, it's got to be transparent. You got to make them feel very comfortable. Um, and so I think that respect and trust, I always like to get to the storytellers before I get on set with them. Maybe it's a phone call, maybe it's a Zoom so they can see me so they're not surprised and I'm just popping in the chair with Claire and going, hey, Claire, nice to meet you. Okay, let's let's talk about the ocean. You know, so there's some warm up here, you know, treat them as humans. Like Dave said, everything's got to be human connected. And so a good storytelling process would be to meet the interviewee, try not to give them interview questions prior because you don't want them to be a robot and memorize anything. You want it to come from the heart. Um, another story I'll share with you doing a piece for United Way. And this young man made it out of a neighborhood outside of Boston, which was just remarkable in itself. And he was an attorney by then. And we went back to his neighborhood and he said to me, he said, Patrick, he goes, do not portray this neighborhood as a bad neighborhood. This is where I grew up. And I said, I got you. I said, we will not. And after the film, he wrote me a note and he said, thank you. I respect it. And he goes, I love the film and I'm very proud of it. So those things to me are so important. I still have chills. And this happened like 10 years ago or 15 years ago, but I still get chills from those stories. And I think that was a successful film because I treated him with respect. He relaxed. I portrayed his neighborhood where he came from the way he wanted it to be portrayed. So you do always have to respect the storyteller. And I think that you're going to get a better product in my medium if you do that, if you go through that process. So sorry, I was rambling a little bit, but that's kind of <laughs> it's all over the map. No, really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Patrick. All right, Dave, I think you know what question's coming your way. What are your thoughts on successful storytelling? I I would second everything that everyone has said so far. And, and I would add another E to Claire's uh, list of E's in that I would add engagement. I'm a very results oriented or, or maybe let's say data guided, data informed type of guy. Um, but I think that engagement is the ultimate, like sometimes hard to quantify metric that is the result of of a successful storytelling campaign or strategy. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Dave. Uh, it seems like we're all on about the same page with that question. And I can say the audience is as well. We asked, what do you think is the most important element of a successful nonprofit story? And 100% of people have said a relatable and emotional connection with the audience, which I think is as close to what you all were saying that we had in those four options. So uh, it seems like we're all on the same page with that. But if you have any questions about what that would mean actually in practice, that could be a great thing to submit to our panelists in the questions tab or the chat. All right, Dave, I'm going to stick with you and have a, you start us off with our next question. What mistakes or missteps have you seen nonprofits make when it comes to storytelling and engagement, and how can we avoid making those same mistakes? This is a good one. And again, I have to give an answer from the you know, seat of, let's say, from behind a keyboard or from behind a screen. Um, that's where I have the most experience. And I think that the answer to that would be timeliness. You, you can really, I mean, this is all what we're talking about as it pertains to online engagement, let's say, or getting more donations online or getting more involvement from your community online on a social platform or on your website, that doesn't matter, is the idea that when you do want to bring them in and ask them for a story, it can't be months later. You know, um, one of the, 
one of the one of the stories that I got from a nonprofit once was, and this rings true for quite a few, is that well, we try to send surveys every six months. You know, well, how many of those people that are potentially, you know, you're you're wanting to fill out that survey, how many of them have actually interacted with your organization in the past week, past two weeks, in the past six months? I think this is, you know, largely pr problematic. And so I do think there's a lot to be said for um, capturing the story when it's still emotionally fresh. I think that's the, the best way that I could put that. Thank you, Dave. Kristen, over to you, thoughts on missteps and mistakes that we should be avoiding as nonprofits. Totally underscore that, Dave. I think that's right. Um, I think also common mistakes we see in, um, let's say telling a specific um, story um, in your, the special appeal at an event. Um, Krista in the chat said conflict is important to what's being overcome. I think that's, that's a great um, add to what makes a successful story. For me, sort of mistakes are when you utilize that moment to get into um, jargon <laughs> about your organization. Um, I understand that your program staff feel very strongly that getting this name, this piece of the information about their program is, is really important. Um, for your donor, understanding your impact is more important. So I think we have to be cognizant. We're in the work these things are second nature to us, um, really telling something in a way that the donor understands um, versus it being mired and mucked in sort of some of your internal jargon. And I think also um, data. Dumping data in the middle of an emotionally compelling story, study after study, Paul Slovic out of Oregon did a study where he asked, told people a story of one, story of impact, asked them to donate, told a story of many, 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 and all the data around how many their 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 donation was going to help, asked them to donate. 50% decrease. So you're killing donations by adding data, which is counterintuitive. I know people want to use data to scaffold, and there are modes you can do that. But when you're in that really emotionally connective storytelling moment, talk about the connection, talk about the impact, talk about all of those pieces first. The other stuff, you have a lovely year in strategic report. You have all of these other channels that you talk to donors in. You do have donors that care about that. But in those story moments, I think it's being clear on what your purpose is and what you're trying to accomplish and have that lead the story. Thank you so much, Kristen. Claire, over to you. Any mistakes or missteps you want to warn us about? Well, I was totally going to talk about the data one. That's the biggest mistake. And, and people think that, well, okay, but probably combining a story with data, that's probably the very best. And the research shows, no, there's a very famous experiment with Save the Children, where people were asked to save one child story. They gave a certain amount. They were asked to save, well, I don't know, 20,000 children, they gave less. And when you combine the story with the data, they still gave less. You know, I, I used to work at a food bank and when I came in, they had a standard story that one in five people in the community and one in four seniors were hungry. And great, but I mean, it's a shocking data point, but people can't relate to that evidence of poverty. They can't put a face to it. They can't imagine the impact on the child or their mother or their grandmother's life. It's just hard cold data and it raises more questions than it answers. And MRI studies have shown that when people are contemplating really helping a particular person, they get this shot of dopamine, this warm glow. But then when you enter data into the picture, it triggers another part of the brain entirely which starts to calculate, well, what does one in four mean? And what does food insecurity mean? And they start to like want to better define the problem, not solve the problem. So I would say that is, it's just a, a huge problem. And I thought I'd for repeat. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you so much, Claire. All right, Patrick, final thoughts on mistakes and missteps we should be avoiding. Sure. Um, trying to be everything to everyone. So they're not focused, too many message points, you know, trying to, I always say in my, in my world, in my business, it's like the act of a play. There's three acts, act one, act two, act three, and then adding too many people to the story. 
and then you the viewer gets lost. You got to keep it simple. Keep it to three people. Keep it to five people. Good things in the odds, not in the evens. For some reason, I don't know. Maybe it's the way our brain is wired. But three fives and sevens work really well. Two fours and sixes don't for some reason in, in the arc of a story. Um, and so I would say adding too many people, getting political. We got to have this board member in there. We got to have this person and they're not relevant to the story. So you're jamming up your story um, and uh, just trying to get to limit your message points. Keep it simple, as, as everyone said. And I totally agree on the data thing. People get carried away with the data. It's yeah, it's. It's not the time and place for nonprofit in storytelling. <laughs> That's just my opinion. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Patrick. We have one final question before we're officially opening it up to our audience. So this is my final call to submit those questions. If you have anything you want our panelists to address or maybe even a specific panelist to address, now is a great time to submit it and then we'll get through as many as we can. Again, we also have some from registration. Patrick, I'm gonna stick with you for this next question. What tools and resources are out there for nonprofits to support their storytelling and engagement strategies? Wow. Um, I can't, I don't know if I can speak, you know, I can only speak from a small little space that I'm in. Um, but I, you know, as I said, there's just so much visual medium out there. Um, and so I always ask potential clients, potential nonprofits when they ask me, Hey, I think I want to do a fundraising film. I want to do a branding film. I said, okay, send me what you feel that you want to do. Like send me a competitor's piece, send me a piece that you've done. And I always think that is a good tool to have something that you see a competitor do really well and send it and, and replicate it, copy it. There's that's, that's flattery, you know, uh, not against it. You know, obviously you're not, you know, stealing licenses of the direct music and anything like that, but I'm just saying, uh, uh, you know, that, that would be my best thing. You know, YouTube, it's just too big, but go to some smaller social platforms, see what they're doing. As my my 25 year old son said to me, I'm about to go off and do another nonprofit career piece next week. He goes, Dad, you have about six seconds to catch my attention. And he goes, that's it. He goes, you better make that six seconds really good. And I said, got it. <laughs> so. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Patrick. Claire, over to you. Any tools and resources you want to highlight to the group and when they're working on their storytelling? I, I really like to bring in um, resources from other disciplines. And one of the things that I really like to look to is neuroscience, psychology, behavioral economics. And one of my favorite books is Robert Cialdini's Principles of Influence and Persuasion. And these are all things that help people act in the face of uncertainty, which we're all in that state of uncertainty when we get a fundraising appeal. And if you look closely at all of those six principles, they're story-based. And, and reciprocity is the story of giving back and paying forward, making the giver a good person. And commitment is the story of acting consistently in accordance with your values. And social proof is the story of joining with others and doing similar things scarcity, the story of not missing out on an opportunity, authority, the story of following in the footsteps of other people you respect, and liking, the story of liking something or someone because of shared commonality. So it's always a good idea to use one or more of those persuasion levers in a fundraising appeal. And if you tell stories, you almost naturally do that. Great, thank you so much, Claire. Dave, over to you, thoughts on tools and tips and tricks for storytelling. Uh, well, if we're talking about social proof, I know one place to look, but um, no, I, I, I think that if, if we're talking tools, you know, and, and again, from an online per, uh, viewpoint here, I really do believe that, you know, nonprofits are best picking a few select, a select few, um, let's say social profiles that they can actually engage with um, meaningfully, not just have the account and post things there, you know, again, like that one way street, but um, actually meaningful engage with uh, the community there. Um, 
and potentially doing things with like Slack or Discord or um, I mean, community events are also great. You know, there's a lot of digital, you know, sort of there's always something on a screen, right? And things like this. But um, yeah, I think it's just being able to actually utilize the tools that you set out to to use. Um, that'd be my best advice. Great, thank you so much. All right, Kristen, any tools or strategies that you want to highlight? Yeah, I think um, I think we overlook what's what we already have. So I think one of the biggest resources you have is to start a storytelling culture within your own organization. And for some of you out here, I hear the groan. I know it. You're you're it's you feel like you're trying to turn the Titanic. Um, but I think within organizations, if you can start a story bank and you can start your meetings with what is inspiring you about our mission this week, I guarantee you they're going to tell you a story and it's going to be a story of impact. And then you can start not only creating cohesion and dialogue within your organization to boot, this is hard work, buoy yourselves by hearing these amazing stories of impact. But then you start that bank that can feed to your point, Dave, sort of that continued, I love the idea of, of storytelling engagement with donors being that donor cultivation we keep talking about. It doesn't have to always be you on the phone asking them for money. Tell them a great story. Tell them what they're doing. Tell them what they're a part of. Um, so I think creating a story culture within your organization is a really great resource. It's free. It's time. But I think over time, you can start to make that engagement um, feel less like you're sort of rolling a boulder up a hill within your own organization. I also think, um, you know, creating relationships with someone like Patrick, having a videographer that you have a relationship with over time that you can call and say, hey, we've got this event. Could we get some B-roll? I don't know what we're going to do with it. They start to understand what you're looking for, what your mission is, how you tell your story, what your impact is. And then that relationship that they have with your story comes to bear on the pieces they continue to produce for you. And so I think cultivating long-term partnerships in your storytelling with the tools you're utilizing makes your lift so much easier and allows them to bring their expertise to the table. So those are, those are some pieces I'd recommend. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kristen. Very quickly, Claire, in the chat, someone has asked for that book name that you just uh, suggested. It was your favorite book uh, that you find to be really helpful. I don't know if you can remember which one it is you said, but uh, they yeah. would love to hear it again. It's Robert Cialdini's Principles of Influence and Persuasion. Incredible. Thank you so much. L -D -I -N -I. Awesome. We're going to officially move over to audience questions. And I'm actually going to, with the first one, smush a few one of the ones that came from registration together because they're all about the same topic. And Kristen, you totally predicted it. People are wondering how you gather stories. How do you collect stories effectively? And how do you get people to consistently submit their stories in various ways? So Kristen, I'm going to have you start us off. I know you were already starting uh, us off on that conversation already, but I don't know if you have anything to add. Sure. I think if we're, you know, if we're talking about a focus being centering the storyteller, um, I think a great way to continue to do that is to engage your staff to talk about the things that are emotionally compelling to them, right? Then already you're, you're doing that work to understand what that is versus people sort of sitting outside like they're looking in a zoo and being like, oh, that could be interesting. That could be interesting. You know, I think when we get in the strategy space, we start to pick stories based on like, that could talk about these four programs in one swoop. Whereas if we reverse engineer it and really start to talk about what's emotionally engaging about our work, how are we creating impact, then that can start to lead how we're telling stories. Um, and so I think it's literally as simple of, could you start every staff meeting with, what has inspired you about your work this week? And maybe in the course of four weeks, you get like two great stories. It's two more than you had. Start putting those in the hopper. Start your board meetings that way. Start, start all of your internal pieces that way. Talk to donors that way. You know, what's inspire, what inspires you about this work? Why is our organization, how does it coincide with your personal mission? Because then you start to understand how people are impacted, what that looks like, and what, how, they, how they see this fulfilling on the impact that they want to make. And that's your staff too, right? They work there for a reason. 
nonprofit work isn't the easiest and it's not the most lucrative. So if they are still in those trenches, there's a compelling reason why they are and they're inspired in a way by the work. And I think starting to, to understand that for your staff and having stories come to the table is how you start building that bank of work. Great, thank you so much, Kristen. Dave, do you have anything to add on this question of actually collecting the stories? Yeah, gosh, I, I don't want to just sit here and be like a walking billboard, but uh, Kristen, you mentioned the phrase story banking. Um, you know, that's what that's that's literally why I built Proof Pact because I saw nonprofits collecting stories. You know, in email, in you know, in Excel spreadsheets, Google Docs. You know handwritten letters, things like this. Um, there's other tools out there that, that do similar things, you know, like SurveyMonkey and, and these sorts of things. But um, I think that the, the idea is that if, if, if you're intent on actually being inclusive of your community's voice, you know, the idea is that you need something to facilitate that. And a story bank is a good start, having all your stories in one place. Um, benefit, you know, bonus points if, if they are searchable and, and things like videos are transcribed and things of that nature. But um, yeah, again, I, I, I don't want to just be an advertisement. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dave. Claire and Patrick, I want to open it up to either of you. Would any either of you like to jump back in on this question of actually collecting the stories? Claire? I would say that you, you need to give people the opportunity to experience the story. And so it's really important to send your development staff out into the field. It's very easy to get detached and also your board members out into the field. And I can remember one time that I sent some of my staff at the food bank out to a food pantry at a, at a public school and they came back so what they discovered was all of the kids wanted to know if they had stuff to drink because their water fountains didn't work. And they were so upset that these kids didn't have water. And they came back like they just want to do a fundraiser themselves about for the, the, the kids at this school. And that story just permeated our culture for like the next couple of weeks. And so you do that with board members too. And then you have them share their story at a board meeting. And then to Dave's point of story banking, you have to put somebody on your staff in charge of capturing those stories and putting them in a repository of some sort. It's not gonna happen by itself. And I'll just add uh, to follow up on all three of you and you guys are dead on, is I think a lot of people tell stories that they expect or they want us to hear. And when you get to interview them and dive a little deeper, then you get into, you peel the onion back and then you get a really good story. And they're like, well, that's not interesting. And I'm like, oh, no, it's really interesting, you know, because it, they got, they're protected, right? You know, they've gone through trauma or whatever it might be. So you really have to dial and dig a little bit deeper as much as they'll let you uh, go. But I think the initial story that maybe the nonprofit hands you is like, hey, here's the story of Patrick. And you look at it and go, well, this is kind of vanilla. And then when you talk to them, all of a sudden it's like, whoa, no, there's like three or four more stories here. They're so much more interesting than this initial story that they submitted. So that would be one thing, like go go that extra mile, go that extra step into those stories. Colleen, can I can I tack something onto that? Uh, yeah, so Patrick, man, that that's good good point. Because I think that when we when we look at timing, like we, we, we talked about timeliness of, of actually collecting these stories too. So that way they're top of mind emotionally fresh. It's also, um, I think what a lot of times, you know, nonprofits try to do is they try, they try to guide the story. Like you said, try to put them into a bucket and that when you remove that and it's just, what is your story? I think is, you know, as, as plain and simple as that might sound, you're getting something that's from them, not guided by you. 100%.
Wonderful. All right. Unbelievably, we are almost at the end of time. So our audience, if we have not answered questions that you still have, I want to make sure you get connected to the relevant person who could answer your question. Maybe you have something specific to your organization that you didn't want to bring up with the whole group, but you still want to get answered. If that is the case, we have just pushed a poll live where you can indicate interest of which panelists you're particularly hoping to hear from because you have maybe a question or a comment or just want to get connected. So fill out that poll if there's someone in particular you want to hear from as well as you can check off as many as you'd like if you want to hear from the whole group all right i do have one final question uh, for each of our panelists to kind of say goodbye to you all but make sure we hear from you one last time and it is thinking a little bit big and going a little bit broad but it's my favorite way to end panels so i hope you will bear with me uh, Kristen, I'm going to have you start us off. What do you see as the future of storytelling for nonprofits and how can nonprofits get ahead today? I hope, I hope the future of storytelling is as it has been and we continue to sort of carry the mantle, but that it really becomes embedded in the work um, and that we continue to utilize it as an opportunity to bring donors into our work. Um, I think the 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 more we can truncate the distance um, between the work and the people helping support the work, um, the more we stay in the space of the transaction we're looking for that feels good, non-manipulative, ethical, all of those things. So bring donors into your work. Stories are the perfect way to do it. Great. Thank you so much, Kristen. Dave, over to you. Thoughts on the future and how we can get ahead today? Yeah, I would, I would agree with what Kristen said. And I think that Again, taking the, the digital lens approach here, um, it's really about creating a platform that brings those people in. Um, but in terms of where I see it going, I, I think that we're seeing a lot more, you know, attention is the new commodity, right? So I think that we're all fighting for attention in one way or another. And I think that um, some of these more micro or niche uh social platforms are going to, you know, really be a channel for um, nonprofits to be exclusively, um, you know, authentic with their communities, I think is the best way to put that. Great. Thank you, Dave. Patrick, thoughts on the future and how we can get ahead today? I'm stealing Dave authenticity, you know, that's, that's so huge, you know, this next generation, I'm going to speak for myself, is so bright. They've been inundated with so much information and they're a very, very hard audience. So looking to the future, this next group coming up is going to be a lot harder sell. <laughs> you know, they really are. Um, they they can sniff it, earlier discussion, they can sniff it out very quickly. And so you better be on point and you better be transparent and it better feel real. Definitely. Thank you, Patrick. All right, Claire, concluding thoughts on the future and uh, how we can get ahead. Well, I think that related to the authenticity is identity. And, and I saw a great article on Medium last week that was called, to keep your readers hooked, pitch them their own identity. And, you know, we've heard about find your audience, but you also have to think about how do you define an audience in your work. And so instead of pitching your organization and your programs, you focus on who the reader wants to become in your story. It's not a term paper. It's not a dry repertorial kind of thing. It's not about your product. You know, you think about the big brands like Nike, they don't really sh sell shoes as a product. They sell identity. Air Jordan gives you wings. And they're, they're triggering this identification, this emotion, this empathy. And so I think that that is what a passionate, engaging, experiential, emotional story does. Absolutely. 
All right, with that, we've reached the end of our panel. I wanna give a big thank you to our panelists. I know if we were in an in-person setting, there'd be a round of applause. So just know that I'm sending that to you all emotionally through the screen today. I do also wanna give a big thank you to our audience, to our amazing live audience who has been talking to us in the chat, as well as to those watching the recording. Again, thank you for your time. Hope you learned something that you can take with you into the amazing work that you're already doing. We are rooting for you. You're doing an amazing job and we're, we're glad to be part of your journey and hope that it is helpful. I do hope you will join us for future NX Unite panels. We have a packed spring and summer of panel sessions ahead of us. So keep your eye out for sessions related to capacity building, CSR, fundraising in general, gratitude, and more. Uh, we're always adding new topics. So the best way to keep up to date on everything that's happening is the NX Unite website, the NX Unite LinkedIn, as well as you can find me on LinkedIn, and I'll try to keep you up to date on everything that's happening. All right, that is it for me. Again, a huge thank you to our panelists. Really appreciate your time and I hope you all have a nice rest of your day. Bye everyone.